Felly nawr um, braint i mi uh, wneud y gwir i gael gydeirio fy hyn ac i gyflwyno i chi ar gyfer sgyfis. Wel, ni wedi clywed yn dydyn yn barod, a oedden ni'n eilio ac y tegu i'r cyd ymdeimlad. Fe roedd y parchedig ddoctor John Tudno Williams wedi sôn i chi, Diane. A dyn ni'n meddwl amdano chi yn y cyfnod anodd yma o golli eich gŵr ac yn ni'n gwerthorogi eich dewrder yn enfawr wrth ddod atom yma hyw i drydod darlith. Mi roedd Dr Sterling wedi cael ei ordeinio i'r wynedogaeth yn y flwyddyn 2008 a fel oedd John Tidno Williams wedi sôn gyda chefndi'r gwyddonol cyn hynny. Dwi'n deall ei bod wedi dal y swydd, yn de am o hwn yn swydd, dwi'n meddwl, swydio mor ddiddorol, cyn i ddi teimlo ar alwad i'r wynedogaeth, yn de of Chief Explosives Officer for the North West of England. That is such a superb job title, I think. The, the thing isn't working, is it? The, the interpretation, no, is it gone? I'll, I'll continue in English then. We are very, very thankful to you, Dan, for coming under such difficult circumstances, but we do appreciate it. And um, I now have the honor of transferring the session to you. Diolch o galon i chi, Dan, am y ddod. Diolch yn fawr iawn, a dwi'n y bod yma heddiw. I'm very pleased to be here today. So you can see my title, Pledge God or Hand of Man. When I thought about doing this talk, of course, we weren't in quite the climate emergency that we are in today. So it's turned out to be quite topical, um, hopefully. Um, could I please have the next slide, please? And my th thanks to Miara for producing these slides for me. Hand of God and Hand of Man. I don't think anyone can deny today that climate change is happening after the heat waves we've already experienced this year. People of my generation and older look back to 1976, it's that very hot, dry summer. But now heat waves are becoming more frequent and they last for longer. And of course, Wales is not alone in this. Next slide, please. Most of Europe, too, is suffering from very high temperatures, which has led to wildfires and water shortages. Have the next slide, please. Indeed, water supplies are likely to be a problem in the future as reservoirs dry up. Water is likely to be the new gold, the most valued commodity in the future. Have the next slide, please. Oh, you've got done it automatically. And the effects on crops have been devastating with reduced yields of wheat and other cereals, exacerbating an already growing shortage resulting from the war in U Ukraine. This is um, some uh, land of my late father's and we can see that the crop this year of the wheat is very much depleted compared with normal um, due to the very hot, dry summer that we've had. And this then is the situation across the country. And it's not only arable farmers that have been affected. The drought has led to a shortage of grass so that farmers have already started to feed their hay and straw and silage, which was re reserved for the winter for their animals. They're now feeding it already. And animal cereal prices will be high this winter with the poor maize and barley crops and fertilizer prices again exacerbating already high costs resulting from the war in Ukraine. And of course, we are not an island, even if we live on one. Climate change is a global problem. We have recently heard about wildfires in California covering more than 55,000 acres 
and floods in Kentucky, forcing people from their homes and resulting in a number of deaths. It's winter in Australia now, but there have been frequent reports there of bushfires in the summer, following the unseasonably high temperatures. Earlier in the year, there were floods in Europe and parts of Africa. Next slide, please. And now we are hearing about terrible floods in Pakistan, which have resulted in over a thousand de deaths and over a million people have had to leave their homes. Often, it is the very poorest third world countries that suffer the worst droughts and floods, which is very unfair when you consider that it is the first world countries, including us here in Britain, that are politically economically stable and have enjoyed good, good industrial growth. It is our countries, our first world countries that are releasing the gases which cause global warming. But what is the Christian standpoint on all of this? Or is global warming all part of the natural order of things? Is climate change due to the hand of God or the hand of man? In the book of Genesis, we read of how God appointed humankind to look after the earth. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, <clears throat> be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over li every living creature that moves on the ground. The use of the plural, let us make man in our image, is likely emphatic rather than suggesting that God was having, is having a discussion with the heavenly court. It is quite awe-inspiring to think that we, humankind, have been made in God's image. It gives us responsibilities to try and live up to that role. Humankind represents the culmination of God's creative activity. As the psalmist reminds us in Psalm 8, what is man that you are mindful of him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the seas. O oh Lord our God, how majestic is your name on all the earth. Christ showed us the way of what it means to live up to his example. It means trying to show respect to our fellow humans, putting the needs of others before ourselves, living holy and righteous lives as far as we are able. But it also means showing respect to God's creation. So how does this fit in with God's command to rule over creation and subdue the earth? For many, this is an open mandate to exploit the world. Lynn White, in his article on the historical roots of our ecological crisis, noted that man's relationship to the soil changed once farmers teamed up and started working together over several farms with bigger plows and more oxen, rather than tilling their own little plot with their single horse and small plow. He said 
that formerly man had been part of nature. Now he was an exploiter of nature. And as we know, this was just the beginning. Over the centuries, and particularly since the Industrial Revolution, technology has been developed to grow more and more food, all to the detriment of the environment. In the last century, we've seen hedges being removed to give bigger fields, suitable for ever bigger combines and tractors and other machinery to work the land with little human intervention. Fertilizers have been pumped into the soil to increase yields and pesticides and herbicides have been sprayed onto the crops to keep them healthy. And all of this has led to a loss of biodiversity in plants and insects, birds and other wildlife, as well as water pollution of our rivers and seas. I don't know whether you remember, but not so long ago, if you went on a drive and you came back, you'd find your wind, in, windscreen was covered in insects. I don't know if you noted that you have very few insects on your windscreen, getting lots of biodiversity. Strict regulations have now been introduced to limit the use of fertilizers and pesticides and prevent polluted water runoff from the land. And the use of genetically modified crops can reduce the need for sprays through genetically modifying plants. But this has its own ethical concerns too. Genome editing may provide a better way forward. In gen genetically modified crops, a significant amount of genetic material is transferred from one species to another. So for example, um, could we have the next slide, please? A gene from a soil bacterium can be inserted into cotton plants to make them insect res resistant. And we see here the um, cotton in the fields there. And this GM cotton has enabled pesticide use to be decreased by more than 80% in Australia. In this um, milder technique, genome editing, the transfer of genes from one plant to another is carefully targeted. And in this way, only a small part of the plant genome can be changed without introducing material from other organisms. So this may be a way forward um, with crops and use, less use of pesticides. Looking back again, um, if we look back far enough, in ancient pagan religions, every part of nature had its own guardian spirit and was considered to be almost a sentient being. This included trees and rivers and streams and mountains and hills. And this meant that before a man could cut down a tree or build a dam in a river, he had to consult the spirit of that tree or river. This generated a huge respect for nature, with people working with it rather than against it, and therefore preventing it from being exploited. But with the advent of Christianity, the belief in guardian spirits, of course, was dismissed, and humankind thought they had a right to exploit nature. So projecting forward from this could lead one to the conclusion that climate change is due to the hand of God. For as reported in the book of Genesis, God said to humankind, let humankind rule over the earth and let them fill the earth and subdue it. Certainly, this would seem to be a mandate for humankind to exploit the earth and use it to their own ends. White noted that St. Francis of Assisi recognized the need to show respect for nature. And he put forward the idea that all, St. Francis put forward the idea that all creatures have been designed for the glorification of their creator and should be respected. 
but many dismissed this idea. We have the next slide, sorry. So this is St. Francis with all the animals and creatures around him, respecting nature, respecting the rights of all the animals and creatures as part of God's creation. But many dismissed this idea of St. Francis's as reverting back to pagan ideas of the natural world having guardian spirits. White proposed that Francis should be made the patron saint for ecologists and said, we shall continue to have a worsening ecological crisis until we reject the Christian axiom that nature has no reason for existence save to serve man. Another writer, Dubos, write, wrote about St. Benedict and the Benedictine monks. And he noted that Benedict made it a rule that all monks should work with their hands in the fields and in shops. According to the Benedictine rule, to labor is to pray. Dubos regarded the first chapter of Genesis as speaking about man's domination over nature. And he contrasted this with the second chapter of Genesis, where God placed man in the Garden of Eden in the spirit of stewardship rather than mastery. Benedictine monks have been practicing this stewardship since the establishment of their first monastery in the sixth century, farming the land in such a way that they are working with rather than against nature. So perhaps they were the first true environmentalists. So to what extent is God appointing humankind to rule and subdue the earth? A mandate for us to exploit it for our own ends. Is this really the hand of God? Or are we just interpreting what God says according to our own whims and thoughts. Klaus Westermann, in his commentary on Genesis, notes that having dominion over the animals does not mean that they should be exploited. It refers more to the responsible rule of a good king, following the example of his creator. And in this interpretation, when humankind is encouraged to subdue the earth, it is given in the context of a blessing, which, by view of God being the creator, is effective for all living creatures, a blessing for all living creatures. They are to be respected. Not so far from the idea of St. Francis as well. We are here to be stewards of God's creation and modern translations, which replace subdue and rule, we take charge and be responsible are nearer the truth. Our stewardship should be directed entirely to the benefit of God's kingdom and his glory and for the good of others and not for personal gain. We have a vertical relationship of care for the earth with God and a horizontal relationship of care for our fellow human beings. If we neglect abuse, and despoil the world, we are damaging something that is precious to God. The creation is God's and has been given to us for us to look after. We should be its stewards, says Westerman, not its exploiters. And certainly the Hebrew scriptures reflect a benevolent stewardship and close relationship between Israel and the land. Israel's experience is of being in and belonging to a land which is never fully given and never quite secured. And Israel's faith is a journey in and out of that land. There were strict rules under Jewish law regarding how the land was to be managed. The land was to be left fallow every seven years. This must may have been to avoid exhaustion of the soil. And the book of Leviticus indicates that the land was left fallow in order to give it complete rest. And in the Jubilee year, 
the 50th year, all land was left fallow and also restored to its original owners or their descendants. This was because all the land belonged to God and could not therefore be sold into perpetuity. However, there is no evidence that the Jubilee was actually applied. It would certainly have been e economically disastrous as it would mean leaving the land fallow for two successive years. But the whole idea was to manage God's lands, to keep the land in, good, in a good state. We turn now to the book of Job. The book of Job presents us with a different standpoint on the debate between stewardship, which puts the current climate crisis in the hands of man, and on, on the other hand, a mandate to exploit the earth, which allows us to use the earth to our own ends, and therefore puts the current climate crisis in the hands of God. Have the next slide, please. Here we see Job pleading with God. If the climate crisis is in the hands of God, then it is thought that whatever happens is all part of God's plan. In this situation, our role is just to give thanks to God and worship him for all that he has provided for humankind. For he has provided a world for our use with animals and plants to be used by us as we wish. But in the book of Job, God is challenged by Satan to allow him to test Job. For God is certain that whatever Satan does, Job will not stop loving and worshipping God. So take, Satan took away all of Job's property and animals, his servants, his family, and then finally attacked Job himself with a nasty skin disease. Job never turned away from God. We see him here pleading with God. Job never turned away from God, despite the words of some of his friends, so-called Job's comforters, we call them today, who said to him that he must have done something wrong for God to be punishing him in this way. Job, of course, was unaware of God's wager with Satan and insists that he had done nothing wrong. Job expresses his sorrow to God that he doesn't understand why he is being punished. Then finally, God answers Job out of a whirlwind. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourselves like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. We have the next slide, please. Here in this slide, we see, we see that God delights in his creation, the natural world and all the living creatures therein. It is not a world which has purely been created for the benefit of humans, but for God's delight. And Job is simply part of this great interconnected universe. God is in control of everything. And Job's role, as indeed is our role today, is to be faithful to him. God challenges Job. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? Can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead the bear with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? And here we see in these slides some of God's wonderful creation. In this answer from God, 
which is found in chapters 38 to 41 in the book of Job. There was no mention of humans at all. The land, animals and plants are completely independent of humanity. There is no mention of stewardship here. Nature is seen apart from the interventions of humans. The lion and the raven are fed not by man, but by God. For God says to Job, do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in a thicket? Who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? And the wild creatures too resist domestication. Will the wild ox consent to serve you? Will he stay by your manager at night? Can you hold him to the furrow with a harness? Will he till the valleys behind you? Will you rely on him for his great strength? Will you leave your heavy work for him? Can you trust him to bring in your grain and gather it to the threshing floor? God continues, can you pull in the Leviathan with a fish hook? Can you put a cord through his nose? Can you make a pet of him like a bird? Any hope of subduing him is false. The mere sight of him is overpowering. Who then is able to stand against me? Everything under heaven belongs to me. Everything under heaven belongs to God. Job is awestruck by God's power and sees that he himself is just one of God's creatures. He is given a new understanding of God's world and is satisfied to leave everything to his wisdom. And finally, God rewards him by blessing the remainder of his life and restoring his fortunes. Does this mean then that we should leave everything to God's wisdom, leave the world to run as it will, leave everything in God's hands? Should we leave the effects of climate change in the hands of God, knowing that in his wisdom, he will find a solution? Perhaps though, looking at the book of Job, that future may be one without humans. We have the next slide, please. James Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis certainly suggests this. Under this hypothesis, the Earth is seen as a superorganism. It's represented in this slide with man and animals and plants, all part of the one circle. It's a planetary sized ecosystem called Gaia. This regulates properties such as climate and composition of the atmosphere automatically so that they are comfortable for life. In this way, humans, animals, plants, microorganisms, and the earth itself all work together as part of this superorganism and all are interdependent. James Lovelock notes that there are consequences resulting from every change that we make to our environment in this model. And he noted, we must learn to live with the earth in partnership. Otherwise, the rest of creation will unconsciously move the earth itself to a new stage, one where humans may no longer be welcome, one where humans may no longer be welcome. Unfortunately, we have not looked after God's planet. We, already, we are already seeing the effects of climate change across the world. And with global temperatures expected to rise by at least 1.5 degrees C by 2050, the race is on to prevent that temperature rise being even higher with the terrible consequences 
of large parts of the world becoming uninhabitable due to flooding or soaring heat and wildfires, together with frequent tornadoes, tsunamis, and other devastating storms. Surely we owe it to our children and our children's children to protect the planet. The COP26 conference in Glasgow was successful in that there was global agreement to speed up action on climate change. Hopefully, nations will continue to honor their commitments. Time will tell. I'm Sarah Dengis. So what are the gases causing climate change and where do they come from? We have the next slide. Oh, you put on it. Thank you. With the advent of the coal industry, which was in full swing in the 19th and 20th centuries, global emissions of carbon oxides, together with particulates, filled the atmosphere. The particulates gave rise to the smog encountered in many cities when every house burned coal in their homes. The particulates were also the cause of lung diseases. On the development of the oil and petrochemicals industry in the 20th century. Next slide, please. There's further accelerated emissions. And petrol and diesel cars in particular on our roads also emit particulates from the exhausts. And this is a particular problem in cities and is likely the cause of an increase in asthma in young people. Carbon oxide, particularly carbon dioxide, contribute to global warming by trapping heat from the sun that has reached the earth that would otherwise be radiated out into space. This is known as the greenhouse effect. You have the next slide, please. Last slide, thank you. And some warming of the atmosphere is necessary to keep the earth at a suitable temperature for life. We can see here the greenhouse effect, but the problem is that this warming has been enhanced by man's activities, producing additional greenhouse gases, which are shifting the balance and creating excess warming. We can see here in the slide, we've got the greenhouse effect. So we've got solar radiation traveling from the sun to the earth, quite natural. And some of it is reflected by the earth and up into the atmosphere occurs quite naturally. Then, but most of the radiation is absorbed by the Earth's surface, surface and that warms it. If we didn't have that, the Earth would be something like 30 degrees cooler and wouldn't support our life. And infrared energy is radiated from the, the Earth's surface and some of it passes through the atmosphere and some is absorbed and re-radiated in all directions by greenhouse gas molecules like carbon dioxide warming the earth and the lower atmosphere. And it's good that we have this. The problem is when it is going to excess, which is what we're seeing now, which, because it's enhanced by man's activities. In addition to carbon oxides, other greenhouse gases include methane and nitrogen oxides, water vapor, and halo carbons. You might remember there's, I just put, put it about 20 years ago now, there was a huge problem with the ozone layer, um, hole in the ozone layer, and a lot of aerosols and refrigerants, which are uh, um, chlorofluorocarbons, were blamed for this. Um, and refrigerants have now been improved and a strict control on it. Um, and also we don't use um, the aerosols that we used to. So that has been adjusted. We've still got a hole in the ozone layer, but it's not as bad as it was. But you will notice we all need to use a lot more sun cream than we used to. And that is all to do with the fact that we've still got a hole in the ozone layer. And there's still problems with the halo carbons because again, they contribute to um, the green, greenhouse gases. So looking at this, it seems that the scientific evidence 
places the blame for climate change squarely in the hands of man. It is not a natural course of events dealt by the hand of God in an ever-changing and evolving world. Whether we interpret the remit given to us as the task of ruling or stewardship of God's world, it comes with responsibilities. Davis and Jones, in their book, Krishnogaith Agwidoniaith, examined the Christian concept of stewardship as given in the New Testament. It is a kind of trusteeship in the same way that we have trustees of museums and natural gallery, national galleries who look, look after the national treasures on behalf of the public. God trusts humanity to care for his creation. Davis and Jones also refer to Klaus Bockmill's book, Conservation and Lifestyle. Klaus notes that every Christian should think of himself as the tenant farmer running the farm, which is all of God's creation. They are answerable to God for the way that they run their farm. I think these pictures help us get a picture of what stewardship is like. We are all responsible for our actions. So does that, this mean that climate change is in the hands of man, not God? but perhaps we can dismiss it by saying, well, we personally are not to blame. But when we look at our actions over time, each of us has driven our petrol or diesel car, stoked up the fire with coal, traveled across the world in aeroplanes, filled our rubbish bins with plastic and bought food that has traveled around the world to feed us. We have strawberries in December because they've traveled across the world. At least now we are waking up to the problems and looking at how we travel, how we can use less plastic and recycle things, how we can use public transport or drive electric cars. And we're thinking whether we need to make that journey. And can we holiday at home rather than abroad? Can we grow or buy food locally? and plant trees to offset our carbon footprint. So is climate change in conclusion in the hands of God or the hands of man? I suggest that it is firmly in the hands of man. We have not looked after God's world, which has been carefully designed by him to allow all of his creation to flourish. We cannot totally turn back the clock but we can prevent things from getting worse. I think we have a duty of care to do this, not just for our sakes, but for the sake of our children and our children's children, and to be good tenants of God's creation, which has been entrusted to us as creatures made in God's image. Amen.